call the meeting to order at six o'clock. First on the agenda, are there any changes or additions, Dan? Yes, I have uh, approved um, the certificate of item mileage. Yeah. All right. All right. Next, approve the minutes. The minutes of March 11th, 2019. Do I have a motion? Make a motion to approve the minutes of March 11th. Second. second. And a second. Any further discussion? Yes, there's um, there's several motions that are indicated four zero when I uh, believe they should all be five zero for votes. I should say, not motions. Okay. Like under liquor control and under board reorganization. Yeah. Uh, liquor control. Uh, more liquor control. But, but if it was, uh, would you have been allowed to vote? Yeah. Vice, vice chair position? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like the one for me. It's You're allowed to vote for yourself? You You're allowed to, yeah. yeah. It's sort of, un, you know, I didn't vote, though. Well, I voted for myself. Right. <laughs> I think that's correct, because I didn't vote. <laughs> okay, so that was correct. <clears throat> so just but add. Chris is the 5 0. Right, and then that motion under liquor control, 4-0, okay. <clears throat> should be 5-0. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Is the, that next one, next page two, that uh, the top there? Octopo. <clears throat> that should be 5 -0. All right, is there any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? So pass. Community concerns. Do we have any community concerns tonight? Seeing none, we'll move to liquor control. Sarah? Liquor control. Second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? So pass. <clears throat> Um, three businesses on the list. El Toro did their first class class, um, but now they've submitted their outside consumption. Um, Pizza Main has first class outside, and Star Lunch just has first class. Okay. What does it mean, like El Toro has like liquor class, like no under that? Not you. You don't need to approve a first or second. You already. Approved we already did it. it. Oh, you okay. already did it last time. All right. We're just approving the outside consumption of it. All right. Do I make, hear a motion? I'll make a motion. We accept the outside consumption for El Toro, Pizza on Main, and Charlemont restaurant. Oh, no, no, not Charlemont. Oops, I have to redo that. Yeah. Okay. I make a motion that we accept the outside consumption of alcohol for El Toro and Pizza on Main. Okay. And how do you want the, because, so actually. So I have to do it again? <laughs> We just say, <laughs> as they are I listed. would just do the slate of them. Yeah, yeah. just approve okay. them all as they're listed. Okay, yeah. I approve them all as listed. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion's passed. The motion is not I have a motion and a second. Second. Yeah. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We are out of liquor control. Next, new business. Auto review at Glenna Pound. Welcome. Thank you. Would you like me to sit? Sure. Okay. You could bring a chair. You can bring a chair. You don't have to sit there. If you're if, if you can be loud enough, you could sit where you are, but if you're not loud thank enough. You. Thank you. So I want to thank everyone for the opportunity to audit the town of Morris Town. I found the staff very helpful and um, eager to learn and improve, so that was great. Um, we went over 21 adjustments to the financial statements, and most of those were for capital assets, transfers, and pensions. So the prior auditors did not give um, the staff the opportunity to book the pensions, and so we went over 
the reports and how to book the pensions. And I think your finance director will take care of it before I get here next year. So um, we... Oh, excuse me. We've never been asked that before by the previous um, well, auditors. Yes. Um, a few years ago, it was a new requirement to have your pension no disclosures. Yeah. And so a lot of um, auditors just went ahead and made the adjustments for the town <coughs> without reviewing it and going over. But I like the town to know their numbers That's and good. so that they can do the work themselves. Mm -hmm. So another addition was the library. So we, um, the library was excluded, but new requirements, we, um, they were for fiscal years ended in 2016, had the requirement that um, component units be blended, especially since it's a governmental unit. Um, your trustees are elected by the town people on town meeting day. So it's a governmental unit, and because um, they're so much part of the town, they're fiscally, um, they, they receive a benefit from being part of the town, and so they need to be merged with your financial statements rather than shown separately as a component unit. So we did that this year as well. I think you had mentioned that. Well, I think previous auditors have said that they were aware, right. and then the last of others said they weren't. So we go back and forth on a little bit. Well, now it's not clear. Not clear. As as That's good. Yes, the standards are clarified that so that because there was some problem with that okay. interpretation. So, do you have any questions for me? I have a question about uh, reserve funds. You know, uh, auditors always want us to have more than we have. <laughs> Um, we always have, you know, a pretty good amount, but it's not the percentage that the auditors would like us to have. And what's your take on it? Well, I, I noticed you have no negative fund balances, which is really good. Um, no. A lot of towns have at least one fund with a negative balance. But um, I work for the town, and so I'm going to <laughs> say that um, as far as management, with uh, with having healthy funds, you don't want to raise your tax base too much to right. burden the taxpayers as well. Yeah, yeah. Dan sort of helps us with that, but uh, I know it's always a struggle for us because we keep hearing that we should have more of a reserve than we do, and um, a lot of our taxpayers give us a hard time about having a big reserve. Well, the one you know. thing that you do really well with your budgeting is that you allocate funds for your different major projects right. and your major expenditures. That's because Dan yes. gets us to. <laughs> so, and Tina. So that is great, yes. Yeah. So as long as you continue to do that, then um, you have a healthy yeah. fund reserve. I think this year it did, we were about 7.5% somewhere on there on un unassigned funds, somewhere in, in that number. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's about where you're at right now. There's been different recommendations between 10 to 15 percent. We're at about seven and a half, somewhere in that. That's good. In the past, also, with some of the other auditors, both Brian and I have gone up and met with them and, um, you know, looking for things that we could do better. You know, one of my questions was, um, how can we be more transparent, you know, to the public on different funds? But um, I think we're doing the best we can. Um, um, I think your financial statements really clarify a lot of information about your various funds, um, as, <clears throat> because you have so many. Mm -hmm. And then um, they are combined in, in the first set of pages, but the detail is in the schedules in the back. Yeah. So I, I do think that you are transparent that way. That's good. That's good. Is there anything more we could do? To, to I've, I've worked with Tina as far as making suggestions. Yeah. Um, sometimes I think you're a little bit too transparent <laughs> with the number of account yeah. numbers and the number of funds. You have so many account numbers right. and so many funds that I recommend it if you do not have an expenditure. Um, what, for instance, you had expenditures and line items that were only five hundred dollars in the financial right. statements, and I think that you can um, classify expenditures and, and compile them, so it doesn't take so much time to look through all of the account numbers and yeah. compile the information. Well, and more work for Tina and Paula too, isn't it? Yeah. 
Sometimes that can go both ways. Right. right. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you working with your staff. Thank thanks, you. thanks for coming in. They thanks. said they appreciate you working with you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next. Conservation Commission. Use of funds. Ron. I'm Ron Stankel, chair of the Conservation Commission, and I have Libby Grant Tion. Welcome. Uh, thank you. We, uh, a wonderful event that happened a couple of weeks ago with an article on the front page of the Free Press about uh, Stowe Land Trust making a move to to serve 750 acres of the Brownsville area of Stella. Uh, we discussed at our meeting that <clears throat> we would like to donate $1,000 out of our insurance fund for that conservation movement. The Stella Land Trust has invested in the town and they have saved the process. <laughs> conserve some of the Valcor property out near the pond. So Dan said that we should probably come to sort of slight voices as town money and not just conservation funds. But anyway, <clears throat> if everyone read that article. Yeah, I did uh, read it. It's a real good article. I'll read this with you. Yeah. But I think this is a worthwhile thing. It's a very valuable recreational area up there. Um, where I got most of the deer I ever got. But uh, it's a nice hiking territory, and I could not visualize that being developed for housing. So mm -hmm. I'm looking for approval for a thousand dollars out of our reserve fund to go to the Stowe Land Trust. My only question is: uh, Is any of it in Morristown? Is it all, it's all Stowe property? It's all Stowe property. I just like that, Grant Tan. That I think this is a great chance to partnership with Stowe and an opportunity to uh, save a valuable piece of land. Um, Morrisville and Morristown and Stowe Williams have a long history of usage in that area. The town line never bothered anybody. Uh, the opportunity to get that land into a town into a state forest where, where it eventually will go. It will become part of uh, the Putnam State Forest so it will be available for multiple uses. Now, a number of us for the last three years have noted that since Mr. Story died and other people have been in the land, immediately went into posting, and people who had walked and hiked and rode their horses and everything else up there for three years didn't do anything. So it kind of brought your attention, my gosh, that's gone, unless we do something with it. Yeah. So the, the price was tremendous to start with, and then the family, the Story family, lowered the price down to about five million or whatever, and got it to within a reasonable amount. So I think it's a great opportunity for Morristown and Stowe to cooperate in a, in a good venture to save an important piece of property for public use. And the uh, Morristown Conservation Commission voted unanimously to take part of our reserve funds with your permission uh, to spend on this cost. A thousand. What does everybody think? I had the same concern you did about the taxpayer dollars leaving the town. <coughs> and I understand their point. I think they have a lot of validity to that, but I, it does make sense a little off with me that the money would be going to another community for conservation right. land there. Yeah, that's. I but, can think of about a dozen people that will give me a hard time when they hear it. But Ron, you said something about um, the Stowe Land Trust, whatever, helped purchase property here in Morrisville? Stowe Land Trust is the spearhead for purchasing. There's already been $5 million donated towards the purchase of that. So Stowe Land Trust will be making up through fundraising the, the remaining need to purchase the property. And as Grant explained, after it's purchased, it's going to be uh, these are the state of the law, so um, so we'll get some tax dollars for that. Go ahead, Brian. The, the two points that I make in response there is, is that uh, Stowe Land Trust 
it, it's just an agent, it's, it's not it's a unit, but it has spent some of their money in Morristown you know, to buy lands that eventually returned, some was returned to state, Mount Mansfield State Forest and others are, are conserved land for Morristown and other people to use. In this case, the money isn't going to stow eventually, if you look at it in the long run, it, it, it's our chance to be a partner in getting a piece of land that will be valuable for all of the Memorial County for that matter, but it will be part of a, a state forest. So it will be different than, it's, it's not a town forest or anything else, it will be part of Putnam State Forest. Well, that's one thing I wanted to bring up. That's why I'm sort of playing devil's advocate, because I know Stowe Land Trust has used a lot of money in Morristown over the years. Like you said, the Valcor property and other properties too that they've... Yeah, up in that, that's right. Places. And, um, you know, as long as it's give and take, I don't have a problem with it, but I do know that a lot of Morristown taxpayers are going to say, what? You know, because it's Stowe Land Trust, you know. Um, they might have a problem with it. What, what do you guys feel? Same concerns, but I think in the spirit of par uh, partnership, uh, I think is really important, and it certainly will be accessible to our residents as well. I agree. <clears throat> the other thing that I feel like is you guys do a great job for us, and you know a lot more about it than we do. You, you bring these things forward, and although you can't say, okay, we're about to donate the money, it has to come through us, you do a lot of thought and research and have knowledge about it more than we do. You know, I happen to know about this one, but um, I trust your judgment. So, what's the percent of the thousand dollars represents out of the reserve? Fund? That was my question. Yeah, yeah. what's the fund balance? Well, there's thirty thousand in reserve fund. We have thirty thousand in the CD, and then we have another forty-eight hundred in the money market account. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have a problem with. It. I just like to have it be explained in a way that uh, you know there's give and take with, with Stowe Land Trust. Is you know I know they do a lot in Morristown. I know that property well too. I knew I knew when it uh, became off limits. I had up there as well, okay. and um, a lot of Morristown people use it. So. Tricia, go ahead. Yeah, if you know, I forgot about the Valcor property. Yeah. And you know, I know some of the Valcors. It couldn't have happened without Stowe Land Trust, that right. whole parcel of land that was preserved. And I, I do think about that. I've heard right. a little discussion about this thing. And the thought of this because going into a state park eventually down the road, I, I, at first I was honestly opposed to this right. funding. But this is for the good of all. And I think he, he, you as select board members could do explain to everyone, you know, would you invest in Elmore State Park from Morristown? Sure we would. Our right. kids go swimming there, your kids do, our families have picnics there. So I, I guess in the sense of it going to state land eventually, I, I think this is for the good of all. This is good for the Loyal County, yeah. this is good for our citizens, this is really good. Maybe we can have some explanation help from Andrew back there too. <laughs> I want to say too, I trust you guys. That's what we, you're there for. You, you know more about it than we do, and you come to us with a recommendation to do it, and you're in fact your whole group voting for it. So, and I think it's great. One small thing: it, it's, it's part of more so the view shed, as they call it. You <laughs> can't go to Stowe without looking at Brown Mountain. Or I always call it Brown Hill. You know, and it looks nice now. I, I would hate to see. And not against houses because I live in one, but I'd like to see it as a forest and not as a development. And that's what will happen to us. Yeah. Good point. All right, do so I hear a motion regarding that? Make a motion to approve it. <coughs> do I have a second? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> So fast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One quick question. We're going to have a Clark Park pretty soon, too. Oh, nice. <laughs> well, it's always been there, but I'm uh, going to bring no, it up. That's a, park, that's a write up that uh, Tim Sargent gave me. I reviewed it. I liked the description. So, and I mentioned it to Dan a week or so ago. So we're moving in that direction. If people don't know where Clark Park is, most people say, where's Clark Park? Yeah, 
you go down <clears throat> A or B Street and we <clears throat> down where the powerhouse is, <clears throat> that land down Gordon River, that's Clark Park, or it will be Clark Park and Clark Park Extension, because some of the land was not in the original deeding by Mr. Clark and, and around 19, it was before 1910. 1903. In 1927, unfortunately, all of it went down Thanks a lot. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Ron, Ron. 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 Not that warm out, Ron. <laughs> All right, next, number three, downtown parking discussion. Yes, um, the last summer probably we need to board out a discussion about parking, angle parking on the main street from the Union Bank down to the New Citizen Building. Um, with the completion of the A Street to B Street project last year, we had a small section of angle parking put in. Over the course of the winter, primarily, there were some safety concerns that were brought to me. So before moving forward with that, we were taking the whole downtown this summer. I just wanted to bring those come, that conversation with everybody and, and talk about the safety issues that I heard and then let the board figure out what you want to do with that angle parking if you want to move forward or not. Um, primarily in the winter, um, two things happen, you know, the snow builds up and then it narrows up quite a bit. Um, so I watched in trucks, especially down trucks with wings, which we have our own trucks, we have the state trucks that go through because you do have a wing line. It, it's all hard for them to get through, for what would be possible for them to get through that crossing center line or waiting one the other. There's also a note from a bus driver in the area on the letter he contacted me. Especially pickup trucks, SUVs, something like that that's parked there, sticks a long ways out mm -hmm. into the the um, into the travel way, pretty basically. And, and he has a lot of concerns with it being on down because he literally has to wait for traffic to clear. And I think that may be counterproductive to what we want to do to keep traffic flowing. Especially people have to stop and wait for traffic to clear before they get through. The other complaints that I heard is the, the backing out. Um, if there's a pickup truck or an SUV, SUV and you are in a normal car, um, you are really at the mercy of the, the traffic that's coming towards you when you back out because you cannot see literally until you are out in the lane of traffic. That's coupled with the statutory, um, and the chief can talk about this to a certain degree, that if you are backing out of a parking spot and you hit somebody, it's your fault. Whether that individual is coming and saw you or not, um, it's still your fault. Those are the concerns, and there's still a lot of concerns about parking um, downtown. So I want to be able to go back and work with the state before they really start this project. And if we leave everything as it is now, or we put any parking in there. And there's a lot of concerns that I want to talk about. Those are my observations, and then there's a lot of the feedback that I got. Who has some comments about that feedback? I do. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I think I think all these points were raised previously. In this Would you identify yourself? Sorry, my name is Joshua Goldstein. I'm on the planning council. I'm a local yeah. person. Thank you. Um, I was very in favor of this in September of '17 when you unanimously approved it. We went through a psych walk. We looked at it, um, and I've been waiting for it to happen. I think it's a big difference for the town. I understand here the concerns. Um, I don't have a list of dozens of towns that do it otherwise, but angle parking exists in the world. And the world turns and trucks slow down and they have to be a little more careful. Um, part of the reason I want to see it, and unfortunately Rhea who owns Ruel Salon there isn't here, she tells me all the time that they're staring out their window in the salon and people try to cross and then they run out because you know they're coming out of the four corners and just whoo. I know we set up a a speed car for a while and didn't find a lot of speeding, but I mean, just casual observation shows that that possibility of someone backing out of a parking space is going to make you slow down. That's the idea. It's traffic calming practice. So I, for one, would like that. As planning council, I'm trying to fill this town with warm bodies. Warm bodies have cars, so we need every spot we can get. That's not a secret. So I, I think the net gain was. I don't even know, 8 or 10 or something, but every one counts. Um, again, casual observation from, from other people in town, I'll let them talk too, but 
those three spots that are angled now are a favorite because of the ease of pulling in and out. <coughs> Excuse me. As opposed to parallel parking or um, you know, stopping in the middle of the road. It's very good for the student drivers in town. I see them practicing their parallel parking quite a bit. Here, but, um, I, I think it's been shown, it's been measured. You know, something like 14 feet from the center line of the road, understanding it gets pinched in the winter, but 14 feet is what's left. I mean, a traffic lane is 11, so we've got ample room for it. Um, and I just want to stress that we're, we're building a town for people, not for plows. We, you know, this was one of the snowiest snow years we've had. I don't know the number, but if we plow, you know, 20 big snowstorms a year, mm -hmm. there's 345 days left in that year where we're trying to create community and traffic calming efforts, increase parking, etc. cetera. Um, mm -hmm. that, that's, that's my take on it. I think we had some people chime in, you know, again, I, I'm just surprised it's coming up and I understand why it's like now it's time to do it. So we're rebranding it up, but we, we said, let's do this. Let's try it and see what happens. And we haven't even got to that point. You don't get their, their, their lines. So I, I'd like to see it implemented and, and do it wrong. Thank you. Anybody else? Go ahead. My name is Ashley Isabel. Um, my mother owns El Toro. That's part of the reason why I'm here. And I think we should do the parallel angle parking in that section of the road. Um, partially because if you look at that section of Morrisville between like 10 years ago versus now, there's a lot more businesses that promote like daytime commerce and activity. And as a community member, if you have a meeting over at Black Cat, you get to your meeting five minutes late, meet with the other person, oh, finding parking is terrible. Nobody can find parking anywhere. Um, I agree with what Joshua was saying about, I hear the concerns that Dan brought up from the town plows and the school buses and the larger vehicles, however, Having lived in cities where they do have very tight, narrow roads, people learn just go slower, watch out, be a little bit more careful, and I think it's worth trying. Thank you. Anybody else? I'll speak to the MAC board. We'd all like to see it tried this year. You know, we, we talked about it, we met right. with you, we, and I think I can speak for many of the board members that are sitting here in the room right now. The thing, my comment, the thing about it is um, it's up to the discretion of the person using the parking spot mm -hmm. because like myself, I have a very long truck. It's mm -hmm. a crew cab, a long bed, and I have a plow on it. You know, I would never try to park there, you know, but yeah, I've gone down through there and I've seen long trucks parked there. Mm -hmm. You know, I saw one last week with a plow on it and I'm like, seriously, it's not a parking place for you, you know. If there was some way we could enforce it or have a sign that said no vehicle over 16 feet or whatever, you know, my truck's 22 feet long without the plow. And, you know, it's tough. It's, you, you're leaving it up to them to make that decision to not park there. And that's where you get into a problem, you know, because I had to go well into the other lane to avoid that truck with a plow on it. You know, Richard, what do you, what do you say about this? My position has not changed since last year. I think it's unsafe. You're asking people to back out into traffic. Not to mention bicycle traffic coming down through, somebody comes down Main Street, somebody backs out, hits so them. There's a lot of different. I, I don't. I don't see the benefit of trying that. I don't see the the added spaces uh, benefit the, the safety requirement to or offset the safety requirement. My opinion. You know, that's all it is. Has there been any accidents involved in that no. parking yet? No. Oh, yeah. Well, can, we, can we put compact cars only signs up? Yeah. Could do that. That was... Because I know that... I, it's ridiculous to have a pickup truck there. Yeah. Well, yeah. Right. good point. But yeah. I want to say, because I brought it to Dan a couple weeks ago, every morning down by the new... Thompson's Bakery. There's a black truck sitting in there. Yeah. And he's up on the curb, which is illegal, yeah. to even get in there, and he's still sticking out. When you come down the thick corner, when you get that corner, it's almost like you start to swerve because it's, he's sticking out. So, so somebody works there. I see it there all the time, Joe. I, I know. That's not a long one. Morning. 
Like you said, if we could make it that's that. Leave a note on his truck. No. <laughs> well, we. I know to. who that is. I can talk to. <laughs> you do. Yeah. I think probably everyone knows who it is. Well, that's not even a long, long truck. You know, it's not as long yeah. as mine, but yeah. no, that isn't even a long, long one. And, uh, so that's where I think, and, and of course the backing out. Wouldn't be the first vehicle I left a note on. Just saying. I, I think the point is, this is how community solve things. Not just not doing it. You know, I'd rather see some concrete right. car signs, and if they don't work, and then we start to enforce it, you know, maybe it'll start to work. Yeah. Um, but I, for one, think the benefit is worthy in trying, and that's what we agreed to almost, you know, not two years ago, but over a year ago, yeah. and it still hasn't and, and, Dan, and Dan did just try it, and my, my thoughts, too, one other thing I want to say about this, is now, if we, if we're ha going to have the town resurface new lines, new, everything done, the state's gonna pay for this. So I think we wanna make sure, I mean, we wanna try this and try that, and then- We wanna have it figured out. Let's have it figured out before they get here. Yeah. Too, so. You know, I hadn't, I thought about this one other time, and I think Dr. Dan, you or you and I were talking about it. The area in front of, like the gazebo, I know the parking lot's owned by Union Bank, but we have a right of way there, and I just wondered if, we could re reclaim some of that area that sidewalk into extended all through there, be angled parking, and um, to give us more room out of the travel lane. I was walking down through there, and it looks like you could buy back another five feet or something. There's that brick strip. You could That's what I'm talking about. The sidewalks are still done. I mean, you're not gonna if it was redone, them. you could have quite a lot of angle parking there and be out of the lane. I don't know that we have a right away. We, we were going to have to widen that sidewalk there yeah. to get the plow through, our right. sidewalk plow. But maybe right there, you know, it could be there's eight or ten spots there if you angle park it, I think. Well, that's the, the thing. It was coming back the whole way. It's yeah. Part of the parking scheme. Yeah. But I was just going by and looking at that, and I was like, you know, I wonder if we could do something there. Or, or do a deal with Union Bank. Union Bank did look at it, and they were talking about resurfacing, reconfiguring their parking lot. I think um, they have talked about it to me for a while now. Yeah. Um, but I know they were having a good story, you know, about reconfiguring their whole parking lot. Yeah. But they do own that. If we have an easement or really a maintenance agreement with them right. so that they don't shut off their parking lot so all the businesses in the downtown. So there is a trade off there. They 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 split the maintenance costs. Right. We plow it. We, we plow it and yeah. they pay us some money to do it. But that way they allow everybody in the downtown to, to utilize that. So if yeah. we didn't have that parking lot there and we'd be in real trouble in our downtown. So yeah. they do allow us to, to use that for public parking. As does Lawrence, because um, Lawrence does have a portion of that as right. well. Right. So, um, Go ahead, sir. Uh, my name is Dan McLaughlin. I'm <coughs> up there in the village. Uh, one of the things I was just thinking about, especially around travel lane and even about the black pickup truck sticking out. Is that yours? <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> no, I don't know who's it. Yeah. Uh, but it, um, uh, um, I, I believe of, of the, the travel lane wants to be nine feet. Um, if you put uh, again around a trial, uh, if you put the stripe lines in and then put a fog line at the nine feet off the center of the road, right. uh, just so different people parking there can, you know, when they walk out, they go, "Oh, my right. tail's hanging out." That's a good point. Uh, again, just for the ex for an extra stripe, it'd be re well worth it. Right. I, I also think even if the parking is empty. With that stripe there, I know the fog line. When every time they move it in in traffic study, move it in six inches, the traffic slows down. So I think even on empty mornings, people will try to stay in that fog line. And yeah, I think it might, line there? might work towards training anyway. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that might help potentially you know, keep the offenders from doing it. They get out of their truck and go, uh "Oh, I'm hanging over five feet." Right, and again, a lot of time our perception trying. We're not necessarily trying to hug it for the yellow line, and so when something's sticking out, we get kind of annoyed about it, and, and it yeah. may or may not be sticking out, or not out into the nine foot lane anymore. Yeah, I know the, the tough thing is we want to support our businesses as much as we can, but not if it compromises safety, you know. And at what point is it worth it? You know, that's the tough thing. What, what do you guys feel about? It? I know Eric. I know how you feel, but. Give it, give it a go. Uh, uh, my recollection of a couple years ago is the, the unanimous approval was to put some vehicles out there and take a look at it to see if it was, if it was feasible. 
decision wise. I can tell you that I have never been in favor of the angle parking, so it wasn't unanimous, whatever the vote was. Uh, I'm still not in favor of it. I still say that there needs to be a lot of work looking at off street parking to resolve the parking issue in the village. On street, and at any angles, at the risk, whatever the risk may be, whether it's light or not, is a risk. And I don't think we're doing uh, our entire citizenry. Uh, I just don't think we're looking at the best interest by approving the angle parking in that area. It's just, there's just not enough room. There's just too many things, too much going on down there with people crossing the street. They don't always use crosswalks. Can't see them. Yeah. So I just don't, uh, I don't. I don't think uh, using angled parking as a deterrent to, or, or as a, a means of slowing traffic is wise. Uh, the visual stuff, the, the white line, the fog line, that stuff has had impacts. Yeah. But I just think uh, I think we're. I, I just a bad idea. I think it's a bad idea. Ma'am, go ahead. Um, I knew Mr. Marilyn Nichols. I moved here four years ago, and. Um, I think the challenge is more is that the, the post office has had angle parking. I find that to be, I think the town here deals really well with the, considering you're coming off of the main drag sometimes and have to wait because there's cars turning in. There's often big long trucks. There's often the, um, semi, the uh, big semis deliver the mail. There's dumpsters there. There's a lot of pedestrian traffic. There's a good signage for handicapped and 10 minute parking and two hour parking. I think good signage for compact cars or one hour parking or, um, you know, like some of the restaurants even have takeout parking, I don't know. But I think if there's a way around this to do angle parking that um, the post up, I think, I think is a prime example of you just have to wait and be patient and slowly, you know, back out. Hmm. Brian, you've been I don't know if the, the police, if there's accidents in the post office all oh, Yes, there is. <laughs> and that's the parking lot, really. It's not the same characteristics as right. Main Street. So. Not Route 100, no. Right. Right. Well, you're headed, if you're going to be headed south down Main Street, it's that's the, the as far as traveling, that's the fastest it goes down Main Street. So, it's, yeah. No, yeah. Uh, not really the same makeup of the, of the road characteristics of the parking mm -hmm. lot. Right. It's very busy though, the post office. Yeah, is far it is. Well, you know, we have minor, minor things there. It's one-way traffic as well. Yeah. It's not two-way yeah, traffic. Yeah, it's one-way traffic as well, yes. It makes it easier. Roland, you have any comment about that? Angle parking? I'm not a big favor of it. Brian. Sorry. <coughs> well, my thoughts is, I've said it before, and when I brought it up the other night, I, it's against a lot of back out there. Right. That's one of the issues. So that's first. The other thing is, is I don't think we're gaining that much. I know we may gain five, six part. I would like to see us look into, like he said, off street. Maybe buy some property and put in a big parking lot. Put a parking garage in or something to make more parking rather than five to eight where we're getting people backing out illegally. And again, I'm not in favor of having people backing out and making that our way to slow people down. I just don't think that's the way. If they're going too fast, find the right way to do it, not. I wonder um, if it's worth taking a look at uh, the museum, now that we own a museum in the front lawn there, if we could go in a little bit and have angle parking there instead of, you know, if there's it's enough room. Yeah, there. yeah. We could certainly talk to the, the trustees. And, yeah. Um, we did put some parking spots in there. I know. Yeah, parking spots. Yeah, so end to end. But. End to end. So, um, but we could approach that. We'd have to do so there's a draining structure there. We'd probably have to work around a little bit. But that's. Um, but there could be a potential to take some of the front yard at the museum. Now that we own it, right? I, I think we'd want to work with the, yeah. the trustees to yeah. bring it back. Okay, anybody else have any comment? Oh, you're pretty quiet back there. Well, I, I don't live in Morristown. <laughs> That's all right. You're you know the history pretty yeah. well. No, we did the drawing uh, a couple of years ago when we had that decided. I remember. Street. At that point, it was decided that maybe or not decided, but at that point, it was, what was the 
uh, question came up to put it on the other side of the street because that made more sense. And that's sort of what, what we're proposing this time. It's on the other side of the street. And that, it does work to slow down traffic. There's no doubt about that. When you go through Montpelier, which has the angled parking on at least on one side of the street, you always tend to go slow in that area. I know there's a problem with the plows, but I don't think the plows for 20 days or whatever should determine the fate of the, the, fate of the road system. Todd, you're pretty quiet. You want to chime in what your opinion is? I like backing in the parking. The chief and Dan don't. I mean, I don't like backing back in the traffic either. But this is the compromise position because no one wanted to back in. When you back in, you're safe because you're pulling out into traffic. That's how most people do new angle parking. Um, but that's not going to fly here. I mean, we have there's a letter that Trisha has from the engineer. I mean, the 14 foot line, 14 foot wide travel lanes are perfectly viable. So they pass engineering standards. I would try it, but I'm not a select board member. Can I just throw one thing out and you the problem I understand what everybody's saying about the, the plowing, you're right. However, um, if you watch what we do for maintenance and snow removal, we have a storm. It usually takes us two days to haul the snow out, um, at least sometimes more. Um, they don't take the wings off for that. So it's a constant all year long, especially this winter. I know it's been you know, a lot of snow this winter, but if you really watch a plow truck come through the downtown and they always have the wings on in the winter, they're wide, they're wider than 14 feet. Um, and they're very careful, but the drivers, they don't always have a good visual of where that wing is and what it's doing. And I, you know, we, we get complaints about mailboxes. So it, you're, it's a big truck. There's a lot of things going on in the truck itself. And it's not just the storms that we're talking about. It's moving through the town. It's hauling snow out. There's a lot of people around you. You're, you're paying attention to a lot of different things when you're in that office. So, so just, you know, I know that you can't really count the storms because there's a lot that goes on. So this year we started moving snow in November. This is you know, the end of March. So for the last four or five months, you know, we've had wings on trucks. We've been in and out of the downtown on a constant basis, moving snow, plowing snow. Um, so it, it's not just the snowstorms. It's a constant winter maintenance things that the operators do with, with those trucks and that equipment. So it's not fair just to say these are the snowstorms because that's not really what I noticed. It wasn't when they're plowing. It's when they're doing everything else that they do too. So I just want to add that in too. I'm very sensitive to that. I, I, I hear that. I don't like. But the inconvenience is less than half a year, and we're talking about a 150-yard stretch of road in our town. Out of out how many miles are in Morristown? Completely, we're talking about 150 yards, and we're talking about a maybe it will improve things, and we're just asking for a chance, and we're granted it. <laughs> I would like to bring up the fact that I haven't heard a whole lot of comments about how it might change the flow of traffic in town. Because really, if you're on that street, unless you're going to those businesses, what else are you doing? Cutting out to 100? So people might end up going down Portland to Bridge Street to cut to 100. And it might change the flow of traffic and there'd be less concerns going through that section of the road. That is a good point. That has changed it because of the bypass now. You're right. But, right. but then again, you're deflecting traffic that might stop and get a sandwich on the way by. Or... I believe in the strong re reputations of the businesses that have established. Because <laughs> that's what the bypass, us. the whole bypass thing was. They were afraid to put it in because it was going to take the traffic out of the Kill village. The town. Mm -hmm. So now I think now the town has done a lot better since. So. Yeah. Well, it seems like there's the, the big issue is space, that the, any large vehicle parking there, angle parking, is causing the obstruction. And um, for people to back out and for people to make the corners. So I would suggest, I like the idea of the fog line, sounds like a good idea. Yeah, and then a signage to keep out um, trucks and maybe even vans. Big, big vehicles yeah. have to stay out of there. Yeah, because that, you know, like I said before, it's not the snowstorms of the trucks or the, the plow trucks. You can go by there in the summertime, and if a truck like that black one is sticking out there, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's the people that are parking there that shouldn't be that creates the biggest problem. 
I think. Not just what Dan said, just snowstorms that encroach and pull people out, but for a whole bunch of reasons. What enforcement measure would we put in place in order to keep that from happening? Ticket. Under what? Well, it was Municipal ticket. ticket. Yeah. Be civil. Yeah, it's. You're going to be measuring vehicles? Yeah, I mean, if they stick out past the fog line, yes. Yeah. Right? If they stick out past the fog line, it's pretty clear. <coughs> you know? I think they call it parking the crowd. Uh, in other parking spaces, if you're too far off the curb, you're parking the crowd and they ticket you. Right. Right. I understand. I'm just putting out there. Here. You're asking the police to physically go out and measure these vehicles? No, yes. to me that's not measuring a vehicle, yeah. just if it well, sticks out at all. Well, ticket, we got to have some way of... There has to be a standard. Right. standard. There has to be a standard that's, that's yeah. met or not met. And if it's not met, then the ticket's issued. Right. But, but it has to be clearly defined if we are going to set an ordinance. Which if that's where it has to come from, is a village ordinance, not a state ticket. Right. right. Then there has to be a clear and defined standard by which the, the ticket is issued. Right. And understand that we're talking about having our law enforcement officers who are doing 4,500 calls a year to go out and enforce parking. I don't think it's a good utilization of our resources. I think they've got way more on their hands than they can, you know, they're keeping up with. But I just, I don't see that this is a reliable option. On that note, I would like to say that I've been inside that El Toro building almost every single day for the past two years between the hours of 4 p.m. and 10 p.m. And almost every single day I see a police officer take a walk up the street and then walk back down the street. So they're already doing a walking patrol at that point. Well, my point is the police station's right there. They go in and go out how many times a day. And if you've got a fog line there and it's sticking out, you take a photo of it, write a ticket. Pretty easy. It's pretty clear and divine. That black truck's been illegally parked there. He gets a ticket. Every but day he's parked there. Because so, I mean, no, we, we don't have an ordinance. Uh, yeah, you do. You don't park on the curb and so oh, That's a different issue. Well, he does. Parking on the curb. Right. So that's what I'm saying. It's Could be a shame. Kind of fortunate. Would, yeah. I mean, that's the kind of thing that could help make that parking work. No. And, and I'd be, I'd think more of it if, it if it was more parking, but I just don't think you're going to get that many more. Well, you know the net gain of stasis? Eight, isn't it? Eight. I think it was yeah, seven or eight. I thought, I, I remember eight. Yeah. yeah, there's some radius that we have to be concerned with coming out of the Grand Union, or the Union Bank Union and Bank. the uh, Born. Yeah, I remember it was eight. Does anybody do the eight survey? Eight's a lot or downtown. Mm -hmm. Eight's a lot for these businesses. I mean, as she spoke. From El Toro, I, I hear it all the time myself. Has anybody done a survey on how many? Because I drive by there a lot during the day and going to work, and when I'm not working, and usually there's always some empty spots. So on the road, mm, not too often. Mm, yeah. 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 Multiple times I've tried to stop into businesses there and continued through because there's just no yeah, place to stop. Me too. Yeah. I don't okay. stop. I was going to say, I know some, a lot that I see that they aren't, and that's why I asked if anybody's right. checked it out, because... I mean, not to tangent, but I'm all for finding more off-street parking in town, too, but there's not a lot of dirt to work with. If okay. anybody okay. wants to pay for vertical, let's get talking about it, but, <laughs> you know, it's not, it's, it's, to this point, it hasn't happened. I mean, the, the municipal lot behind the post office is full every day. Obviously, Bourne's and Union Bank is full every day. Brigham Street is... I don't know what that is. That's full every day. So I don't know where you put them. And you put them in the Oxbow, they're walking pretty far. So I, I agree with Trisha. Eight, eight's, eight's a lot. Mm -hmm. What's the harm in trying this before the road's redone? As far as trying to paint it before the road's redone? Doing a fog line and a sign for compact cars or, yeah. And, you know, I don't know when the state's going to start, quite honestly. I mean, we can certainly try. I mean, I think we'd have a pretty good indication within a couple of weeks of. Yeah. I mean, I have some concerns, like, you know, down where the black truck is. Like, mm -hmm. it is a little more narrow than I thought it was going to be, I'll be honest. Like, Me too. So you kind of are doing this sort of thing when you're driving through there. So I think a couple of weeks, you'd have a pretty good indication of if this is going to be a cluster or not. Um, I just commented that I hope it get a little more time than that too. Like if but, it goes I mean, in the first couple of weeks when people are breaking the, in. The chat, so the reason I say that, Joshua, is that we, 
it, we could paint the lines and then they could be coming through and paving. Right. Well, that's... <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> all right. Like right we talked about this a year and a half ago. So, right, but we're, we're, this is all discussion tonight. We're not making a decision <laughs> anymore. What's the measure of success on a trial period? Nobody's For time. Yeah. Nobody damaged vehicles, accidents. I mean, where are we measuring success? That's why I asked if there was any thunderbender. So. I, I don't know. The reason why I brought up once again was, was the safety concern that I observed. You know, um, I do look at that. You know, I, I watch the trucks and everybody moves in downtown. So, you know, it's, to me, it's a valid safety concern. Um, I guess my best suggestion, if there's a prior period, once again, we're still in winter, so it's going to be a while before we can paint. Yeah. Um, these would be to do the one um, section by the gazebo mm -hmm. you, and see what works. Um, you know, I still think we were looking at 13 to 14 foot lanes there. The problem well, is, is, you know, you know, is right now, is like the winter really highlighted for me because, once again, the roads narrowed down so much more in the winter. And the, the vehicles are wider in the winter. There's plows, there's a lot of stuff going on. And the other thing, too, in the winter months, the fog lines and the center lines are, are gone. You know, you, you the sand and the plowing takes them right off. So that's you know, the other thing. But I would say that, you know, I, what I would do as soon as it would be reasonable for uh, the village crew to get out, put lines in, buy the gazebo, and, and see what that brings us. Would that take it down past uh, Thompson's? Then to yeah, the Times could, Argus I building. Could go, we could start at the gazebo, you know, or at the exit of the Union Bank where the ATM is. Okay. Go yep. down to in front of El Toro and just carry it in through there and see how that works. Um, so my thought would be put it in how we want that, it, that's, and yeah. then it works, works or it right. doesn't. I'm not opposed to trying it. You know, give it the best try and see how it pairs. The only thing that, you know, that I want to make sure that I understand what the board won't be do is the, the compact car issue. Yeah. And I think that the PDs you know, is going to ask concerns about enforcing that and what that is. That is. We won't have an ordinance in place by that, no. that time frame by any stretch of the imagination. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll throw I think the police it right in the top of people's cars, put it on there. Stick a photo. I mean, I can say even from the compact car thing, if I park a, 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 a large vehicle in a compact car space, to me, that says, all right, there's a good chance I'm going to get hit here. Like, so I have a tendency to avoid those. Um, I, I said maybe not everyone, but. Most common people do. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not parking our big truck in the stuff that's made for, you know, you go. Sorry, I did. So it, it, it occurs to me that the people park, they're sticking way out, aren't using a lot of common sense when they do it. When you can go by and. It's sticking out so far, you know, you got to go in the other lane to miss that. Well, another thing, too, is maybe get some two hour parking. Because if, if you put it, you put in eight extra parking lots and somebody pulls into town, parks a car there all day, you can gain it. Yeah, I have so, noticed that some of the that angle there. the parking is for people that clearly work down yeah. there. There's a black truck, is that they work there, too? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, I think most people know whose truck it is. So, so we put in that. I did cry. You got a question? <coughs> now, the select board votes to do that down through there. <coughs> cars on a somebody backs out of there and gets hurt. Where could that? Go? <coughs> Where could that go back to? My car on the illegal, the person who illegally backed in traffic. Yep. That's right. What's that? My car insurance. On the, yeah. Driver of the vehicle home. I'm going to say there's towns all over the state that have the same kind of parking. Look at Montpelier. Richmond's not a good example. Look at State Richmond. Street. Richmond. Those two towns, Richmond's, 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 Richmond's not white either. I see it. I travel Richmond's all over the place. I see it. Yeah. Yeah. And that all used to be angle parking years ago. Yeah. I remember when Arthur's was there, it was all angle parking. You know those compact station wagons back in 1970. Exactly. I remember that. I remember the discussion we had here. I, I'm just going to stay the devil's advocate on this one because I remember the discussion being the reason they stopped that was because of the dangers of backing in the traffic. Right. They didn't stop it because it was successful or unsuccessful. It was benefit. Yeah. Increased traffic. 
I'd like to hear from our contractors in town. I know we got to bypass it, but Geriotti, Grimes, Monash, the ones that the high wheelers are coming through town, mm -hmm. you know, how's that going to impact them? What's it going to do for them? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of folks impacted here that we're not probably yeah. represented here. Fire trucks, ambulance. Any other input? He's throwing it around enough that it can move on. We're not going to decide anything tonight anyway, so it'll be revisited. When would we revisit it? So June when the snow melts. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to have the three crew put in the, the plan in front of the, you know, from the exit of the bank where the tellers are, the drive through down to El Toro. No. That's what we're going to do. And yeah, the center line will move over. Center line, you know, we'll move <coughs> as soon as it's reasonable for the, the street crew to get out of here because there's still a lot. So that's good for you. Would you do the fog line down where the angled parking is? So they're going to do a fog line for the back side of the parking spots. What are you doing with the union the spots directly in front of like the union bank? This is the, this is the trial period. If once the state comes through, and then if the trial period works on the angle parking, then it would go all the way down. My point is, though, you kind of want to have a uniform all the way down during the trial period. Like, if you're having that's a parallel with a bunch of angle, it's just going to be a cluster. Okay. So I think you want to do the That's what I said. Right either there. try it all or... Yeah, I'm I'm sure. try I didn't remember what the proposed plan was. So it yeah. starts no, at the corner, okay. basically? Or like where the well, union bank door is? The we have a door place because the, there is a turning radius problem up there. Yeah, yeah right. Union bank. You're right. That's right. the turning radius problem. Yeah. 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 Are there spots? Are there it's parallel spots right now out of that corner? Yes. Like right to the right. Whatever's allowed. There'll be like two or three angles. That's it. Yeah. But you have the whole thing. They go down. So it, it does change because there is you know, the tractor trailers still have to make the turn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Around right there, and it's already tight. To the yeah, area. I think we have a couple parallel and then go to angle. Yeah, but if you, you know, pass the outlet for Union Bank. Yeah, the problem is, is then you know people get confused on what's what. Then you, you see somebody, and I've seen it happening down by you too, um, where they will park parallel exactly where the angle parking spot because everybody else down the street is doing that. Yeah. So, that's going to be the same. Can, can we move? Can we get a compact parking sign where the angle is already? Yes. Or a couple of them. That would be helpful. Yes. In front of the black truck. <laughs> 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 Just put it on the truck. And the chief and I will research what we can do ordinance wise. That would be helpful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. All right, next, Healthy Lemoyle Valley, Allison Link. Baby, welcome. Hi. Welcome. Hi, everyone. It's good to be back. I have a People's Academy Middle Level student who's also on the Youth Council here with me, Andy Tindell, um, who will come up in a few minutes. But we appreciate the opportunity as we're back now with our first update that's not general from Healthy Lemoyle Valley. For those who don't know, Healthy Lemoyle Valley is our local substance abuse prevention coalition for the 16 towns in the area, um, Morristown, uh, uh, voted. Uh, there was an initi initiative through the Morristown Select Board for us to give health updates monthly. So based on the Select Board um, ideas from last time and some of the most pressing issues of the times, we decided um, to go with the topic of vaping, e-cigarettes, and the real health crisis. So I know we only have a few minutes, and I know we've talked about it a little bit before, but I thought I'd just share a little bit on the risk factors and then what towns have been doing so you hear some of the protective factors that are being put in. And I have resources for you that um, we've been creating, um, in particular one that's a data pack that um, you can take a look at that we handed out at our coalition meeting, um, which was just last week or two weeks ago, um, and that was really for the community to take part in how we set our work plans 
and how we can reduce um, substance use amongst youth in our area. So I have the specific tobacco data pack. So I'll just we can hand this out now. I'll get this all also electronically down the line. But a um, lot of risk factors and also um, protective factors around tobacco and tobacco youth for use. If you look at the back of your page on the top of that one, um, you'll see that we know that smoking has decreased. Um, the numbers of people smoking, youth smoking has gone down. One of the reasons for that is that the perception of harm is very high. That youth and, and adults know, we know the harms of smoking um, traditional cigarettes. And so the rates have gone down and down and down. The reality now, and you'll see up top there, is that the perception of harm of vaping and using e-cigarettes um, is very low, 20%. And you'll see a note there that it's one of the lowest, or the, it says the lowest, um, the lowest percentage of harm rate. Like youth today do not perceive e-cigarettes as being a great risk. And that is even lower than any other substance that's measured. That's drastic, and that's one of the main risk factors that we're trying, um, trying to get at. So as for some of what we are doing, I'll hand this out. You've seen some of this before, but this was something in collaboration with uh, our schools, our youth council, um, lots of other um, partners and our tobacco prevention task force that we have in the Mile Valley, that a lot of adults, parents, teachers, adults don't really know um, what the devices look like and they're changing and what they look like. So you'll see here some of the devices like the Jewel product looks like a USB drive. Um, you'll see other ones look like, uh, I, want, I have three kids as you've seen them. Um, so my son said, oh that looks just like a cell phone. And there's one that looks just like a mini cell phone. And we can pass these around to folks who are here. I have plenty of rock mm -hmm. Um, so, and some look like a whiteout, uh, um, some look like a little whiteout. So, so, actually we did a presentation at Memorial Union and the day after a teacher found someone in the bathroom with one that they would have thought was just a, a lip gloss or they wouldn't have known what it was. So the way of monitoring and figuring out what's actually happening is important. We're not talking here about adult use. Um, though that could be another topic, we're really trying to prevent youth from getting um, even started. And we also know that the rates um, from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey from 2017, it's old data. Um, we know that even in our local schools here um, in, in PA, I'll, I'll flip it, nine out of 10 middle school students had not tried e-cigarettes, and two out of three high school students had not tried it. That was data from two years ago, where we believe, though the question was not um, as accurate as could be, because it asked about vaping, but many people who, um, who are using e-cigarettes, they use the Juul product, and that's a different verb. They call it Juuling. So, and now we're two years later, the survey was just given last week in the schools. So we'll see the new data. So we believe that, and you can imagine from all the press, it's quite high. This is some data that, um, that has a span of not just the interest behavior, behavior survey, but it also has data from our um, surveys that we did recently. So there are two surveys here. This is specifically tobacco prevention data. Um, related, but two surveys. One survey that we did that um, was for the entire community. Anyone who does not have a child um, in the middle level, uh, middle school age. That was a different survey, and that's also the data is in there. So you'll see at the beginning there's community survey. Um, there are 40 respondents or so in that one, and you'll see people's perceptions on um, uh, perception of uh, adult, it's mostly adults, it could have been some teens who were in that, but perception of harm, marketing, what we can do about it, so there's some information there. And then in the, the second, the next survey was one that was specifically of middle school aged um, parents because of that's when this is all happening and we want to make, have the prevention really on focus there and at earlier ages. So that's a data pack for you. And I just wanted to jump, because uh, I only have a few minutes, into what are we doing. So we have the Tobacco Prevention Task Force. We're working with all of our schools that have been in the schools. Um, from, I've been in elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, um, staff trainings, 
teacher trainings, working with youth, working with the youth councils. There are tobacco prevention youth groups. Um, PA has, um, in particular, has uh, youth groups in the middle level and in the high school level that are part of statewide um, initiatives. And um, had also went to a, a rally at the state house recently because of um, you know the, the flavored products and the um, the impact of, of those on youth that they target youth directly. Um, and as you may know that the legislature is actually had there are a couple of bills that are out now. One is um, to tax excessively. Um, I think it's like 92 um, percent e-cigarettes. The other is to um, raise the um, age of when, how old you can be to buy tobacco products to 21, just called Tobacco 21. So just as education, those are in the legislature right now and uh, passed the Senate, the T21 um, passed the Senate um, last week, I believe. So what are towns doing and what are possibilities? Um, so there are many. Some towns are doing like what we've done here. Um, I'm a Morrison resident also, so I feel part of that. Um, but you met unanimous, unanimously, you agreed to um, to um, Oxwell Park becoming tobacco free and signage to be in town. So tobacco free spaces, parks, um, we've done here in parks and have on the rail trail where um, we have trailheads. Uh, there are towns that have um, tobacco free um, sidewalks and other public spaces. Plattsburgh just did that. There's um, some other towns on St. Jay. There are some other towns recently who have done things like that. There are towns who are doing um, restrictions on advertising in stores. Uh, you'll see in the survey that big part is like what we see in the stores and the amount of baking kind of stuff going on in the stores and flavors and where it's located, kind of restricting that. On the you know, Healthy Lamoille Valley level, um, we are working with um, retailers to actually look at best practices in the retail environment. And so that's been an exciting project that we've been working on. Uh, other things that are going on, um, like even locally, um, Hyde Park just um, is in the process of, of adopting a healthy community policy that includes some of this, so specifically geared towards not just tobacco, but, um, but all ways of currently and what they might do in the future. Uh, there's outlet density that can be restricted of how many outlets can, um, can sell uh, certain products. There's uh, entryways to buildings. Um, I mean, even we can you know think about outside this building and others of where um, we want we. Um, but you mentioned more signage. How can we do that? And we're happy to help support paying for more signage. Uh, and you can. There's also possibilities of um, of putting. I've seen putting in bans on flavored products in towns. Um, and if it's not a ban for the whole town, then it's okay, so let's take a mile of the school or the parks and we, it's possible to put bans um, on uh, with a uh, radius around a certain area or certain, certain areas as to if we would have the sale of electronic cigarettes. All of these environmental factors are protective factors. So we talked about some risk factors at the beginning, but protective factors are also really <coughs> important. And in the public health, these are evidence-based, these environmental factors of what we can do in society to help reduce the norming um, of, these, uh, of this behavior in particular. But I want to invite Andy up uh, just to talk about why they are concerned about this topic. And I'm going to talk from there or here. Great. Yeah, so as Allison said, my name is Andy Testa. I'm a student at PE, People's Academy Middle Level, and I'm in a variety of different groups that are working on trying to make the school a better place, and a lot of that focuses on vaping in our school. Um, and I, so, so there are a couple things that I have realized recently so that have reinforced the things that I have been told. One of the requirements is in People's Academy, everybody has to take a health class. And one of the things that we've started talking about in health class is vaping. And I've seen a lot of people aren't getting it because uh, uh, there is, I don't know if it's a joke or if people genuinely believe, but whenever people bring up the topic of vaping, uh, specifically juuling, everybody always says, oh, mango is the best flavor. And hearing that all from, from people that I wouldn't, necessarily believe would be vaping uh, makes me realize that everybody thinks that it's normal and even if you don't think it's an okay thing to be doing you think that everybody is doing it 
Uh, and another, top, uh, another thing that came up in that discussion was jeweling. When people bring up jeweling and they talk about the dangers of it, a lot of people say um, that one pod contains the amount of nicotine, the same amount of nicotine as a pack of cigarettes, which it does. Um, and one thing that I had not known up until that point, though, was a lot of my peers said that one pod, they last for about two and a half hours for them, which was wild for me to hear. Um, that there, like, there are people all over the school that think it is normal and that people are doing it, and they know that mango is the best flavor. Like everybody knows, mango is the best flavor, uh, and it just like one pod lasts you for that long. And so it. And the pod is the same strength as a pack of cigarettes. The amount yeah. of nicotine. Wow. Yeah. Well, it depends on how often you use the product. Right. But um, that's scary, though. But this young people are becoming so addicted and not being able to be without it that um, they're going through it pretty quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also, these are the jewel products, which are regular, which have some uh, we have information about them. They they have specific data that we'll put out about what's in it. But there are a lot of knockoffs that we have no idea what's what else is in it. And right. it's not just the nicotine that's in these products. It's many other things, from formaldehyde to a lighter fluid. I mean, the toxin toxins, carcinogens, lead, metals, tin. Uh, it's you know, and even their secondhand. Um, Related, uh, Why are they legal? Mm -hmm. So, Joe, yeah. anything else to add? Um, one more anecdote from a different class. Uh, in one of the groups that I am in, uh, the uh, the coordinator for it was talking about uh, a flash drive, and somebody was like, "What in the world? Like, is a USB? What's a flash drive?" And the only way that that could be explained is that it works like a CD, but it looks like a jewel, because jewels look like. USB oh, drives. Yeah. Um, yeah. Scary. Really powerful. Um, you know, as, as adults, we can maybe you know a flash drive and we explain to each other what a jewel is, but now the students are saying the reverse. And it's, um, it's, it is a challenge nationally, as you know. You read about it in the paper almost every day. There's an article somewhere about vape vaping and what's being done. And you know the state's taking some, some uh, initiative and looking towards what to do and so this is an educational piece you know we're not, this is just this topic and we're happy to bring more information on this topic and others as we go down the line for next month you can let me know through Dan or whoever, or Eric or whoever um, what you want us to focus on but uh, it's also for the board to start you know think about is there anything um, is there anything that this education um, may lead to uh, here? And so if you want, I've given you those documents before, of like policy opportunities and, and options and ideas. And we can look also more closely at um, what other towns are doing. I have one sheet of the most recent uh, towns in Vermont. I can email you this. But this is all 2018 and 19, all the different things people have done on tobacco prevention on this environmental level across the state. And then we have that back you know, number of years. But this is, I have the most recent information. Too, I could email you. Uh, or, or, That'd be, yeah. yeah. <coughs> if you could email it, Allison. I, so the state is looking at <coughs> um, a law to prevent tobacco products to be sold to students, people under 21, which would include the vaping and jeweling. Correct. They, so right now, um, it passed the Senate, and it is called Tobacco 21, as, uh, and it's really to raise the age from 18 to 21. Uh, so I think yeah. I'm just wondering if that doesn't pass. That not that we would. I'm not recommendation. I'm just kind of throwing out a brainstorming yeah. idea of of just asking our businesses mm -hmm. to think about not doing that in our community, mm -hmm. not selling, especially products to kids, especially 18 and under. Absolutely. Um, I was with middle schoolers uh, a month and a half ago. Um, locally right in Tomlinson's and they don't have the jewel product at all. They specifically don't, they have other e-cigarettes maybe and not as many flavors, but they don't, and they have never sold the jewel product because they know the popularity. Interesting, they, I didn't know that about them and neither did any of the middle schoolers I was with. They were doing a special project photographing uh, advertising of big tobacco, basically, was the, is their project for their youth group. Uh, so, and I am working with retailers on best practices around this topic, what possibilities are. Some folks have more, more um, 
control than others, right? So like the, the more independent stores have more control over what they sell than the... Uh, like the friends. Right, exactly. But I mean, the, the supermarkets don't really sell much as it, as it is. But, yeah, but, um, but yes, so, but they're... I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, there we are working with the retailers, but there's also the opportunity for um, towns to also, you know, we, we work with them as much as we can from the prevention end and helping them make decisions, look at best practices, look at theories of prevention, like why, like it, uh, well, I'll just give an example of, I guess I know there's other things this meeting, but one of the youth on that day, um, middle school students in the um, Vermont Kids Against Tobacco group, took a pic picture of Snickers next to lighters, right up, right there on the counter and said, why is that? Why are there, you can imagine her saying this, why are there lighters right next to the Snickers bar? Why are there mango right next to this, right next to that? You know, what, what's that about? What? And so there, there are things not just about the sale of, but also placement. Uh, marketing. Marketing, mm -hmm. advertising. I thought, Todd and I had a conversation um, recently about, you know, the town, town can put in net neutral ad advertising regulations, for example, uh, related to not necessarily the, um, the topic, but um, the size, the um, percentage of a window, things like that, or you know how 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 um, things are advertised. So these are all different ideas people are doing. It is a huge epidemic, health epi epidemic, and I think our whole community needs to um, you know be concerned about it. Well, thank you for all the information. Sure. Has any comments? Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot for coming. I, to me. I just have one comment. <clears throat> the list looks like very. Um, I mean, these are some good initiatives, but they, none of them seem overly drastic. Right. So I guess I would be interested in some of the more drastic more measures, so this is um, in, whether it's in our state or in Sure. Yeah, or yeah. this is um, the most recent ones in Vermont that they just sent to me because it's not updated in our official document <coughs> recently. Um, but like, for example, I just saw, it just passed last week um, in Plattsburgh. They're doing tobacco-free um, all public spaces, which means including sidewalks. Um, they have a hundred dollar fine if you're caught there. I saw the select board there. I don't know what kind of town meeting they had an open uh, town meeting, and I saw um, some of the folks uh, you know who were speaking and saying, "Oh well, what if uh, you know if I'm walking down the street and I see a group of teen teen teenagers right on the corner or right in front, you know, who are vaping? What is that norming for me as a young person? You know, I'll, there's rationale for and against the people who are, who um, are smokers. I want to be able to go out and walk. And where else am I going to go? You know." It's hearing all of that, but um, but looking at what we norm for our young people and what the ripple effect can be, and knowing that the students who use the young people who are using e-cigarettes are more likely that this data shows more likely to then become um, uh, smokers of traditional cigarettes, and then also there's correlation with many other factors, other substances. So there's we're starting to see that literature. Um, I would love to get you whatever I can find. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. One comment, just um, Good, from our, my staff and I, we go get the mail and go to the bank daily, and we've had a concern for a long time, that, especially in the summer, people sit and they smoke right in our lovely chairs mm -hmm. that we love up by. But yeah, we're, uh, that's an it, issue. A <laughs> big issue that my staff has brought up, the secondhand <clears throat> smoke that they're um, exposed to daily walking across the street to get the mail and drop off the mail. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's something that can be done. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times it's yeah. within certain. Yeah. It's a deterrent for people to come in or walk by or across the street, not mm -hmm. to the town office. I mean, there, there are entryway. You can do an entryway. You could do a, uh, a number of feet. You could put signage you know, from, the, from the town buildings. There, yeah. there are possibilities to consider. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm just curious, um, from, from an EMS public safety, public health side, uh, have any towns or cities looked at uh, storage requirements for the liquid nicotine once it's in a residence? Has anybody looked? Because it certainly in the last couple of years has come up on our radar as EMS providers yeah. that if I've got an otherwise healthy child who is suddenly ill at home with his vaping going on, I've, I've got to consider, it's on our radar now, about whether this kid got into the liquid nicotine. Yeah. Uh, the CDC's kind of playing catch up on this with a lot of their data. Uh, some of our best data comes from our Australian colleagues. Uh, they, uh, over a five year period, they had 80 pediatric deaths 
uh, from liquid nicotine, 62 of them were toddler age. Yeah. Uh, from kids putting the, the cartridge in their mouth and sucking it's on true. it. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering if there's been any thought, I mean, I, I hate to have government in people's houses for any other reason, but if there's any thought to how this what with nicotine is being stored in residences to keep it away from children. Yeah. That's similar to the prescription drugs and like the campaigns that we do from Healthy and Wild Valley and prescription drugs. I don't know mm -hmm. what, um, like on, the, yeah. on that level of you know, legislation. Yeah. I do a considerable amount of pediatric but, education across the state and it's, yeah. it's something that we're having to address in these classes now <coughs> about having that high level of, that it's high true. index of suspicion when you've got an otherwise healthy child in, the, in an environment where you know vaping is, is going on. It's true, and edible, CBD, you know, not, Right. There's a variety of like what's on the counters. What's it? There, there are many factors um, yeah. of, uh, keeping this away from kids when it's uh, targeted towards them and in flavors and looks like candy. Right. Thank you. Are kids using e-commerce to buy these? Yes, things? they are. Okay. Yeah, and the legislature is also um, has a part of the bill, like this on the state level that relates to e-commerce, but they they are. Because a lot of the e-commerce are 18 years old. Yes. Um, however, there are there are checks in place that are supposed to be, but most youth get this get the products from their peers. Um, that's where that's where they get it from. People they know. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Jim, would you be able to show this on the TV so people at home when they're looking at it can see this? Um, well, you have a copy there. I don't know if, they, if that I works there. Thank you, Judy. <laughs> um, are there more that you have here with yeah. It's also on our website, healthythemoilvalley.org. If you want to the tobacco section, you can find lots of information related to this. I should have mentioned that already. All right. Thank Next. You. Discuss and approve right away permit for Butternut Mountain. John, is that you? That is, that is us. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. No, no Ira tonight. Uh, no, he's uh, just um, hopefully boiling. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, we're looking to run um, fiber between uh, underneath the road, uh, Industrial Park Drive. Uh, we took occupancy last year of a building that uh, is probably best known here as the former Descartes. Uh, building, we haven't been able to get fiber uh, over there so that we can build out some offices that we, we desperately need. There were some complications going above ground uh, uh, using the electrical uh, electrical poles. So we'll be working with more direct drilling uh, to drill down, under, back up, and connect the, uh, connect the building to the park. So you don't want to dig up our new pavement. That's good. No, we're 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 going we're going under, not through. <laughs> okay. Do I hear a motion? Second. And a second. Any further discussion? So there'll there'll be somebody. Will the traffic be interrupted or disrupted? No, no. As I understand it, uh, again, we'll 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 dig down. Then more drilling will 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 go underneath the road. Put a conduit in. It's on each side of the road. Yeah. Oh. And I believe they've ins uh, 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 inspected the maps to know that what to avoid and and, and, and all that. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All in favor, right. say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion is passed. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Next, update EMS roster. Add and remove volunteers. Have a list? Yes. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Hi. Good evening. Um, so we've got um, we've got four people uh, to come on as uh, as volunteers uh, as candidates. Uh, all four of them completed the EMT class uh, that uh, Diana Osborne and Tammy Lurie did uh, here in Morristown. Uh, that would be Ben Collier, Lori Martin, Rebecca Wheeler, and Steve Foster. Uh, we'd like to get them up and running on the roster. We can start getting their orientation done, get them driving, things like that, uh, uh, to uh, to get them uh, uh, on the roster and ready to go. 
Uh, we did have one for removal. Uh, that person came in today, met with Corey and I, and we're going to ask that that come off the agenda. And uh, uh, we've uh, laid out some expectations with that person to uh, uh, to get that person back and active on the roster. Uh, so I, I, I think we're good. We're good on that front. So I would just ask your approval uh, for those four people to come on as uh, volunteers. I make a motion. I make a motion to approve the uh, slate of volunteers, adding the slate of volunteers as presented. Second. I have a motion and a second. <coughs> Further discussion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? So pass. Thank you. Next, town appointed officials. Do we need to remove Brad? No. No, it's no. he said uh, they wanted to hold yeah. on that. Yeah. Do you want to do all of them? Do we do them one at a time or all at once? Well, we have three wardens in open seat. We have nobody right. for that. Dave Steven doesn't want to do uh, it. He's declined the high paid position of tree warden this year. Okay. <laughs> to do all except for that. We don't need a fence viewer. We have. Uh, you know, we, we're looking for volunteers for that. So. <laughs> no, thank you. I think Todd would be a good fence viewer. <laughs> He's not here. I don't think, actually, I don't think he would be. <laughs> <laughs> what is the fence viewer? A fence viewer is the. Um, Look at boundaries. Not really. They're no. really they're, they're just related to agricultural fences. So if you have two farmers, mm -hmm. um, or a farmer and somebody that's not a farmer, it has nothing to do with you know, privacy fences or property boundaries. It's to decide who is responsible for maintaining the fence to keep livestock on their property. Hmm. And that's all we really do. Hmm. We think we've used them maybe twice since I've been here, something like that. Yeah. If we had somebody that didn't have, have a problem keeping a horse on their property, remember that one? And it was another one. Yeah, there was one of the cemetery down at Miller's Farm. Yeah. Yeah, so the fence there. Yeah. yeah. And that was the, they wanted, they ended up moving the fence. Yeah. And giving them a piece of land. Yeah. So very, very rarely, but it's, it's, it's really all about the agricultural aspect. Of yeah. The all right. How do you want to do it? Chris, take a stab at it. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I was not keeping up here. Is um, so contemplation. That's why I said take a side about it. Yeah, thanks. Well, I have my papers here at home. You the vice chair now. Thank you. Um, all right, so I make a motion to uh, appoint to the following uh, town officials. Uh, emergency Management Coordinator Dan Lindley. Emergency 911 Coordinator Abby Patch. Animal Control Officer Brian Kellogg. Fence... Never mind. Leave that one out. You want that in or out? Yeah, Dwayne Sprague. Oh, okay. fence viewer Dwayne Sprague. Oh. Uh, pound keeper Brian, Bra pound keepers Brian Kellogg and Jeff Foss. Uh, there's an open tree. Christopher Town. <laughs> if not qualified for tree, tree warden. Uh, open tree warden position. Uh, Green Up Conservation Commission. What am I doing here? Sorry, the, the Conservation not. Commission does the, the oh, green, up does green up coordinator. So. Green up handled by the Conservation Commission. The DRB, uh, Susanna Burnham, uh, and the Planning Commission uh, adding. Uh, so uh, they, Etienne Hancock and Alan Bananda. They're, they're off the renewals. <coughs> Do I hear a second? second. <laughs> Is there any further discussion? I didn't understand what you said. Can you do it again? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to do it more eloquently. <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion is passed. Next, uh, to approve the highway mileage. So, we're going to, last year we did accept some highways when we did it in the bypass. Um, and I've been working with the state because they're very, very complicated transfer of property that the state did from us. So, and the state staff has been very, very helpful to me. Unfortunately, there, there's so much information in that 
and we wanted to get it right. Part of it was class one highway too. So <coughs> they really wanted to work with me, make sure it gets right. So right now we're not going to have that on this year's certificate. We're going to put it on the next year's certificate because we didn't have the chance to get it right, I suppose. So I'm still working with them. Um, they won't show up on the highway miles this year, but I, from my perspective, it took me five years to get the state to transfer the property to me, and that uh, year probably really doesn't matter at this point in time. So I'm going to ask you to approve the highway mileage certificate with no changes this year, and then I'm going to continue to work with the state staff to make sure that we get it right. It's more important, I think, to get it right than to push it through and have it wrong and come back. Yeah. So, um, but once again, they've been very, very helpful with me. Um, and we've been working together to try to get it. She wanted to make sure that she had rights, so she went back and forth with, and was working with the people on right away at the state and making sure all the legislative approvals were done to make sure that we're not going back and redoing this again. So Erica has the original. Um, I would ask you to approve it with no changes and we'll continue to work with the state to get it right. Do I hear a motion? Make a motion to approve the certificate of highway mileage uh, as presented with no changes. Second. Is there a second? Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion's passed. Nick, do we have any old business? No. Aye. Approve the warrants. Make a motion to approve the warrants. Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion is passed. TA report. The only thing I'd like to do is um, I really want to thank the highway crew. Last week, um, we had mud, holes, and uh, snow at the end of the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, they did, you know, there were, there were certain tough days there where the mud was so bad out there. I know that they, there really wasn't a lot of issue. They certainly did their best. And, um, I, I heard a lot of compliments coming back in for the work that they did, and I just wanted to share that with the board and you know, when it's here tonight. Um, you know, mud season <coughs> all at once. Oh, you mm. know, it, it, it just literally did. And then you know, this past weekend, that we were potholes again, so we were doing all that. And then we got hit with another snowstorm, so it was a whole different thing, so it wasn't. I really had to thank them for that hard work. That's really all I have. Yeah, I agree with that. Sorry. Uh, like Fitzgerald World, I've been over there for 20 years. I've never seen it look like that before, the lower part, you know. It was bad. It's but everywhere. It wasn't just where it was. But you guys do a great job. Yeah. All right, any questions for Dan? Thanks, Dan. Select board concerns. Chris. I have a question along the same vein. Is um, the end of our road, um, and by your house too, I don't know we... It's Uptown Road? He, well, Lower Mountain Road, but the, um, whatever dirt we used, or sand we used, really huge pieces like I don't know it looks like lots of did we notice that yeah at the end of our road sometimes they come out big clumps I don't know it just seemed like, I don't know if something had changed or what we were using on the roads um, frozen. it just seemed frozen mud. no it's not frozen mud <laughs> it was big I saw the big chunk it's really there in your pit. what's that a lot of silt down that pit gotta break those up rolling <laughs> I don't know I just don't usually notice it and it just seemed yeah, like it was I agree it hammered was... Oh, <laughs> oh. You're supposed to get out there and step on it, like spread it around. It's gonna take some. It's gonna take something to move that off. Some of well, that might be some of that stuff we bought from Naples too, because the billet sands that. That could have been some of that stuff we brought from Naples, because they were out of sand. Oh yeah, this is billet sands that. It's there. Yeah. Anyway, if you have, if you're up that way, check it out. It's not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Run over it. All right, Judy. No, it just hats off to the town crew, the road <coughs> crew, keeping keeping the roads cleared and and taken well taken care of. Appreciate it. Brian, that was my comment too, and it's not just last week. It's all winter. All winter. Yeah. It's been all brutal. All yeah. winter. <laughs> yeah, all the guys. Also, 
Has somebody hit the Bridge Street Bridge again? I'll have to go look. You know the... Railing? Yeah, if you're going down toward Bridge Street and toward the bypass, that piece is bent. On the right? Yeah. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Probably somebody pulled out here. Yeah. Okay. Might have been a plow or something too. It looks like it looks like a car would be hurt. Eric. I just I, I had my voice to the rest about the highway department. I actually had the uh, uh, text message from Yvette Mason, the former member of the board, uh, with photographs attached for the work of before and after shot oh, yeah. all the roads that you guys did. And uh, you know, she was just couldn't say enough good about the work you guys had done, how quickly you responded, how quickly it was uh, it was fixed. So I I told her I would pass that over to one. Great. Yeah, I was going to echo that, but I think all five of us see the same uh -huh. thing. All right. Other business. Eric? Do we have any other business? In yes. Go ahead, Eric. I moved to find the premature general public knowledge of contractual grants with the police union and clearly placed the town a substantial disadvantage by disposing of its negotiations to You're free, you're free. Judy did sign it. I didn't sign it. But they only oh. need three signatures, right? Right, I've got enough signatures. Would you want to sign it? No. <laughs> Do you want these back? Oh, no, you can keep them. Oh, thank I you. I had to borrow. Oh. I forgot my own. Oh. Second. Do you have one, Chris? I have one at home. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any aye. opposed? So pass. I move that we enter executive session, discuss the town's contractual grants for the police union under the provision of Title I, Section 315A1 of the Vermont Statutes to include Dan Lindley and Richard Keith. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And I will that we enter executive session to discuss appointment or employment for evaluation of a public officer or under the provisions of Title I, Section 313 and 383 of the law statutes to include Dan Lindley and Roland Bowman. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? So passed. And authorize Dan Lindley to sign on behalf of the board. Second. I have a second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passed. Take a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs>